I joined as a medic uh, out of high school and spent a year in Iraq as a military police sergeant with a National Guard unit. Um, and I think, you know, I joined the National Guard uh, to get money for, to pay for my education, to get some medical training. I kind of found it different once I was actually in as to what I was receiving as opposed to what I, I thought I'd be receiving. For instance, I still had to take out thousands of dollars in student loans. I didn't always get my tuition paid for. Or sometimes I didn't even get help with my tuition. And as I said, I joined as a medic. And in January, early January of 2003, I got a call informing me that I was no longer with my medical unit. I had been transferred to a military police company and was being deployed and to report the next day. And a month later, I was in Kuwait in the preparation for Operation Iraqi Freedom, um, a misnomer if there ever was one. And so I went in as a military police sergeant to Iraq. We spent the next 10 months there. and. Basically, when I was there, our job was to escort convoys, mainly fuel tankers of <coughs> Halliburton-known vehicles running from Kuwait north into Iraq. And the other job that we did a lot was to patrol the roads, to patrol the cities, and to make sure that things were safe. Um, when I was there, I didn't encounter any terrorists. What I saw more that was leading to violence was Iraqis who were desperate and who were poor and who were looking for a way to provide food and shelter to their families and were turning towards crime because there was no other recourse for them. Um, when I got to Iraq, one of the things that really struck me was the poverty of the people and the lack of things that we take for granted, such as clean water, adequate food, electricity, health care, and these people did not have any of those necessities. And when I left nearly a year later, I was very disappointed to see that the people still did not have these things and they still don't have them today. And it's nearly two years after our invasion under the guise of freedom and a better quality of life for these people and we just have made it worse. And uh, when I was there, we, our job was military police, but many times the actual duties that we were to perform were ambiguous or they seemed like we didn't have a clear mission over there and, our, and what we actually would do was not helping the Iraqi people, it was not helping the U.S. military. One of the things we did very often during the time period that I was there is we would guard the broken down Halliburton trucks and keep them safe from looters. And so we would call for a tow truck to come and get these trucks and bring them back to the base so Halliburton could recover the asset. We would wait for two, maybe three hours so while Iraqi people continued to form growing crowds, violence would break out, you know, anywhere from pushing and using mace to using rubber bullets, and luckily in my unit, we never used deadly force, which, you know, but I think it does happen, and I feel lucky that it never happened with the people I was serving with. And then after three hours, we would get the call that we were to abandon the truck, that Halliburton did not consider it an asset, and just leave it or burn it. And this happened every day, several times a day, for months. And it was very frustrating because we were in a very serious threat of danger. And the main danger was coming because we were guarding and what we were told was an asset, but was actually just a piece of scrap metal. And one of the things that made me feel not a liberator, but more of an oppressor and more ashamed in the eyes of the Iraqi people who were looking at me was when we would get ordered to burn these vehicles, many times they contained fuel and in the area of Iraq and all throughout Iraq, people wait 
in line all day long. They go to the fuel station before the sun rises just in hopes of filling up half their tank of worth of gas and hoping that when they finally get to the gas station, there's still fuel. And we were burning this very precious commodity. Uh, one time that comes to mind, we burned a flatbed truck that had produce in it. And I felt really bad about that. I felt like I didn't want these Iraqi people associating my face as someone who was doing this and destroying something that they didn't have and that was very valuable. I wondered, when, when we first got there, we were generally greeted in a friendly manner by the Iraqis. They would wave to us and smile at us. When we left, 10 months later, things had definitely changed for the worse. People would no longer look at us a lot of times. They would just turn their backs. Sometimes they would give us rude gestures or mean looks. And I was very apprehensive more and more every day I had to go out into the cities that something really bad and something deadly was going to happen because of the way the Iraqi people were being treated under the occupation. And some of the things were actual intended violence directed against the Iraqi people. But more often, it was the unintentional things, the vehicle accidents caused by our military trucks, or the house raid that was the wrong house, yet maybe the 12-year-old son was taken to the prison, or the roadblocks where we searched coffins on top of people's cars for weapons, but really it was only their dead relatives, and I could only imagine what these people were left with and what they were thinking about us. And, you know, I, it's hard being on the ground because all, basically the people over there, and I know the reason why I went over there, it wasn't for the reasons that the administration gave us that we needed to go to war for all these threats to the United States. I didn't believe that. But when I went to the military police company and I looked at these people around me, many of whom I've known from my military career, and saw what they were sacrificing and that they didn't want to leave their families or their careers, I felt <coughs> obligated to them not to abandon them. And, and so that's, I think, why most of the soldiers over there right now are there. They're not there for the president's false promises of freedom and democracy, they're there for the person beside them, and they're thinking about bringing that person home and also bringing themselves home to their family. One of the things that I have personal experience with is the way that the National Guard is being mistreated and abused. Traditionally, the National Guard, which is part-time military. We go to drill once a weekend and train in whatever we do in the military and two weeks in the summer. And we fall under direct command of the governor of the state we live in. So in times of state emergencies such as forest fires, blizzards, our unit got called to serve as medical and security personnel at the Columbine High School Memorial. Things like that where, where we're serving the community you know, and our country at the same time in a local capacity. And now 50%, nearly 50% of the troops over there are National Guard and Reserves. And this is taking a toll not only on the individual soldier, but on the communities. And I don't know if you've experienced this in your community, but I know the people that I served with in the military police company, many of them were civilian law enforcement officers and worked at the Department of Corrections. And so these, they were performing very vital roles in their community, and they were gone for over a year, and now troops are being sent longer and longer, up to a year and a half, and that just includes time in Iraq. That doesn't include the time spent in the training stations before you go and when you get back. So many times, I mean, people are supposed to get a guarantee of getting their careers back, but many times it's just as impossible because they've had to be replaced because they did serve very essential services. When I was in my medical unit, some of the people in my medical unit got sent over and they were hospital workers, emergency response workers, or worked in medical clinics. And, you know, I know of teachers and people that basically do the essential services in their communities and that did not sign up to be an active duty soldier and go fight in wars. They signed up 
to pursue their career, their education, and have a family, and so also to support the people in their community and their state. And I think this is a gross misuse and just abuse of our National Guard and Reserve forces. And I don't think there will be a solution until we end the occupation on Iraq and bring not only our <coughs> military home, but all of our troops home. I know during the eight years I served in the National Guard, I spent a quarter of that time deployed overseas as an on active duty orders. I also spent time in the Middle East after the Kosovo conflict. So, you know, the role of the military is definitely changing, and I only see, and with, if we, the people, don't speak out and organize, then I just see a continuation of this policy to send more and more troops, not only to Iraq, but now they're talking about Iran, and, and that scares me. So I think we do have power here in our local communities and among the, our neighbors and our friends, but I think it's, it's more talking to people and letting them know what's actually going on. And on that, I would like to introduce Michael Hoffman, who's also in Iraq Veterans Week's War. Just like Kelly told you, my name is Michael Hoffman. I'm one of the co-founders of Iraq Veterans Against the War, and I also work as the national coordinator. So on top of my stories, I'm constantly talking to other Iraq war vets and hearing what they've gone through and are going through right now from the guys who are serving in Iraq right now in places like Baghdad, Samarra, Najaf, Nazaria, all these places we have members right now. Um, the reasons for the war that we were given are basically completely false. This is something I knew when I went to Iraq. My first sergeant addressed our unit. This is someone who has been in the Marine Corps for 20 years. His father was a sergeant major in the Marine Corps and was a POW in Vietnam. This is someone who had lived with the war his entire life and knew what it meant. And he told us, don't think you're going to be heroes. You're not going to Iraq because of weapons of mass destruction. You're not going there to get rid of Saddam Hussein or to make Iraq safe for democracy. You're going there for one reason and one reason alone, and that's oil. Mm -hmm. But he went on and said, but you're still going for two reasons. The first of which is, you signed a contract that said you would follow the orders that you are given. And the second point, and this is the important one, is that your friends are going. And you have an obligation to make sure that they come home alive just like they have an obligation to make sure you come home alive. And that's what I'm still doing right now. I've seen this occupation, I've lived it, I've been part of it. And just like the other members of Iraq Veterans Against the War, we realize that the only way to bring our friends home and at the same time help the people of Iraq is to end the occupation now. The presence of the United States military is causing most of the problems because it's an occupation. We invaded their country with basically with no good, actually not basically, with no good reason. And now we're continuing to occupy it, and the Iraqis know that, the troops there know it, and it's creating on all sides. You know, there's no such thing as a good occupation, and we're seeing that right now. It's the treatment of the Iraqis, the lack of the complete lack of understanding of their culture. Something I saw there, just a simple hand signal. When we see this, this means stop. You know, you go up, you wave your hand, that means stop. To an Iraqi, that means, hey, keep going, hi, how are you doing? So there are numerous Iraqis that have been shot and killed just because we don't understand each other's hand signals. Basic things like that. And that happens every single day. We don't understand the language. The entire time my unit was in Iraq, including at the end of the invasion when we did patrolling in the town of Tikrit, we had no translator. We could not understand what the people were telling us. Someone could walk up to us and say, there's a bomb over there, it's going to explode when you walk past it. And we'd be like, okay, that's nice, have a good day. We had no understanding of the people or the culture, which resulted in hundreds of deaths on both sides. And it's another thing that, you know, it's a shame that those who put us in this situation will never know what, what this war really means. You know, the vast majority of them have never served in combat. They don't know what it's like to be in the military and be experiencing these things firsthand. You know, I was part of a Marine Corps artillery battery, which meant I was part of this shock and awe campaign. 
We were shooting rounds 15 miles downrange at targets that were simply numbers to us. And then as part of my battery's advanced party, meaning that when my battery changed from one position to another and moved forward, I got pushed ahead of them to scout out the new position. So I was right up front, right at the battle lines when, when, the, when the main combat was over, and I saw the aftermath of all this. I saw that the targets we were shooting at were cities and towns and people. You know, I saw entire towns and cities <coughs> leveled, devastated. I remember one town we drove past on the way to Baghdad, where the entire western half of the town was on, in flames. The whole industrial area was going up in smoke. I unfortunately saw the, the civilian bodies laying on the side of the road as we pro progressed north. And those things stick with you. They will stay with you to the day you die. The one thing that gives me nightmares is remembering while we were driving north, there was a, 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 an Iraqi position that was in flames, and we started getting a little bit closer. We noticed this horrible, horrible smell that we had never noticed before. And when we got a little bit closer to the vehicles, we noticed that all the vehicles were still buttoned up, meaning they were still closed up. So whoever was in there never had time to get out when the vehicles were hit. So that smell we got were the people that were still inside. And I've talked to World War II veterans, and they said that was the exact same smell they, they experienced when they came upon the Nazi death camps. Those things never leave you. I talked to my good friends that I've met since coming back, and the stories they have are just like it. Sometimes it's just tragic accidents. Another member of Iraq Veterans Against War, Charlie Anderson, he was, they were in Iraq, progressing north, and there was a 50 caliber machine gun, a huge weapon on top of a tank, and there was somebody who got out of the tank on the turn and forgot to put the weapon on safe. So when the next person getting out, he bumped the trigger on the machine gun and three rounds went off. Two of which luckily just shot off into the air. The third round hit a Marine. And Charlie Anderson was a Navy corpsman. He was in charge of taking care of the Marines. He was the first one there. When he ran up, he started taking care of the wound. And what you do in a case like that, you pack the wound with gods to try to stop the bleeding and, 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 and minimize the wound. Well, Charlie started doing this until he realized that it was futile because he could fit his arm up to his elbow into the guy's chest cavity. And there was nothing he could do for this Marine because of an accident. An accident that never should have happened. An accident that happened only because we were there in a war that never should have been fought. I'm not a pacifist. I believe, unfortunately, because of human nature, there are times we have to defend ourselves. That's why I joined the U.S. military. I joined because I wanted to defend my country and the Constitution. That's what we joined the U.S. military for. We do not join up to fight wars of aggression in other countries over war and somebody else's agenda, and that's what we're doing right now. Every single life is being lost tragically in a war we should have never fought. And just like I said before, those who have put us there will never understand that. They'll never understand what it's like to come home after fighting these wars. And the loss doesn't stop in Iraq. You know, this is a war against us. This is a war against the working class, the average person. I, I, somebody just gave me some figures here that this area, Lynn, the school district here, 4% of the students coming out of this school district enter the military. In the surrounding, more affluent, affluent school districts, 0%. Because they're the, we're the ones they can get. I came from, my father was a steel worker, my mother was a teamster. We were most definitely not an affluent family. We were regular working class people. And coming from there, when the recruiter talked to me about, you know, going out and seeing the world, something I knew I'd never be able to do under my own power. He talks about, you know, you get free health care, which is a huge thing for people like us, you know, when we're just out of high school. You know, they say we'll put a roof over you at a regular paycheck, three square meals a day, which is a lie. They only give you two on the weekends. We'll give you money for college, which is not paying out anywhere close to the way they came. And then finally, on top of all that, and we give you the chance to defend your country and leave your mark on this world. Sign me up. Well, that's what they tell you, but it doesn't always work that way. Just like we're seeing in the war in Iraq right now. And also, it's not just those who serve who who lose because of this. It's our families and our communities. When I was fighting in Iraq, right before I left, my father was, was worked with Bethlehem Steel for over 20 years. 
and he was, re he was retired as the plant started to shut down right before I left for Iraq. While I was in the Middle East, the plant went bankrupt, finally, and the Bethlehem still no longer exists. The first thing that happened is that the government took over the pension. Well, of course, because of the war effort, the government cannot afford to pay my, my father's full pension. So, so the first thing they did was cut some of his pension payments, and they cut off all of his medical benefits. My father has severe back and nerve problems. So when I came home, my parents were left with the issue of, well, do we pay the mortgage this month, or do we get your father's medication so he can get out of bed in the morning? That's what I came home to face because of this war. It affects everything. Right now, in Philadelphia, we've, got a, we've had major issues with our, with our local transit authority, SEPTA. So they've been facing bankruptcy for years. Now, because the federal government has cut the overall mass transit funding to the state governments, SEPTA is, even, is, is in an even larger crisis. Right now, their, their solution to their problem is to lay off 500 workers, cut off almost all weekend service, and increase bus fares from $2 to $3 a pop. Now, who's this going to affect? It's not going to affect the, the wealthier people who you know, have had their nicer cars to drive to and from work every day, who don't have to worry about working on weekends. It's going to affect the working class. The poor people rely on things in mass transit to get to work every single day. So now they're going to be paying even more out of their pockets to get to and from work. Sometimes they won't even be able to get to work like they were able to on weekends and during later or early hour hours. We're the ones paying for this. And it's simply not acceptable. We're the ones paying for all of their mistakes. You know, this war is affecting the working class in Iraq. It's affecting the working class here. It's affecting the working class everywhere. And we can't stand it anymore. We've got to stand up and demand an end to this occupation. That's the first step towards solving these problems. And I'm not talking about, you know, cutting and run. That's not what I mean. We have devastated that country between the first Gulf War, years of sanctions, and now this new war. We owe a lot to them, but the military are not the ones to repay it. When I spent four years in the military, I learned how to kill and wage war. That's what I learned how to do. I did not learn how to build an electric grid. I did not learn how to set up a water purification plant. I did not learn how to run a democratic election. These are things the military does not know how to do and is not capable of doing. There are people who know how to do it. The people of Iraq. We need to step aside and let them do it. One of the biggest causes of the insurgency right now is that we have foreign contractors from the U.S. and our coalition of the willing doing jobs that Iraqi people should be doing. You know, one perfect instance of this is the, is the Iraqi electrical grid. This was originally an electrical system made with Russian parts by Iraqi <coughs> engineers. Well, after, the, after this war, we decided, well, we're going to have American engineers rebuild it with American parts. It just doesn't work that way. So now instead of doing a simple repair job, we have to rebuild the entire electrical system from the ground up. That's why almost two years after the war ended, we are still trying to rebuild the electrical grid that Saddam rebuilt after the first Gulf War in 10 months. The people of Iraq are well aware of this. That's why there's an insurgency. If, if we had invaded, they weren't happy about that, but if they would have had food, water, electricity, and jobs, there would be no insurgency. They would have been happy and we could have left. But that's not what this is about. This isn't about making the people of Iraq happy. This isn't about making the people of the United States safer. This is about somebody else's agenda and somebody else's money. And we've got to strike at that. We've got to end this occupation now. drumbeats for war in this country were getting deafening. Uh, and what Charlie and I noticed was that all of those who were saying, we got to go to war, they weren't going anywhere, nor were their loved ones. 
it was our loved ones who were going to be used as cannon fodder in a war that we really believed uh, then and now was about oil markets and building empire and nothing that our loved ones signed up for. They signed up, just like uh, Mike and Kelly said, to, to serve the country, to protect and defend country and constitution. And what we saw is that they were going to be sent into harm's way uh, for all the wrong reasons. Um, and, uh, and so we made a first poster It said, uh, our son is a Marine, don't send him to war for oil. We met a father whose son was in the Army and about to deploy. And uh, in November of 2002, in a phone conversation, uh, our two families decided to create an organization called Military Families Speak Out. We wanted to break the code of silence in the military, which is very strong. Um, and use our voice at that time to try to prevent an invasion of Iraq. So we started this organization, we started talking to other military families, we stood in vigils, we met with members of Congress. Uh, Fifteen of us uh, brought a lawsuit against George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld. Um, we uh, we uh, tried to uh, um, get an injunction on the invasion of Iraq absent a real congressional declaration of war. Um, so we did, you know, anything and everything that we could, um, and uh, we have been continuing to do anything and everything that we could. We started out with two military families. We are now over 2,000 military families across the country uh, and growing every single day. Over 50 of our families are gold star families, families who have lost loved ones. Uh, we have many families with loved ones over there right now. We have many families with loved ones who are going over for their second, third, and fourth time. Uh, but our voice is getting stronger. Uh, in, in response, we do a lot of this issue, taking on this issue of um, supporting the troops. There are loved ones. They're over there. How can you say we don't? Charlie uh, talked to a Newsday reporter once called and said, well, how can you say that you support the troops and you want to end the war and bring them home? How, how can you not support the war? And, and he said, well, imagine if your child was being driven off by a drunk driver. Would you stand by the side of the road and salute? Or would you throw yourself in the path of that vehicle and try to prevent it from going anywhere? He said, the way we see it, our kids are being driven off by a president who is drunk with power, and we are going to do everything in our power. It's the most patriotic thing we can possibly do because there's an abuse of the military that's going on right now. There's an abuse of the people of Iraq, and there's abuse of this nation if we don't do what we, anything that we can to stop it. So this voice has been really growing. It's a powerful voice. In some ways, it was holding a place for a period of time. We were talking about, back in spring of 2003, what we heard from our loved ones. Lack of armor, lack of food, lack of water, suicide attempts, everything that slowly made its way into the media, you know, months and years later. But we knew about it. And now we have firsthand accounts from the Iraq veterans against the war. We work very closely with them. We work very closely with Vietnam veterans and Gulf War veterans who have joined Veterans for Peace and Vietnam veterans against the war. And we are building a very powerful voice uh, that basically says it was wrong for the US to invade Iraq. It's wrong to be occupying Iraq. And there's no right way to do a wrong thing. Bring them home now.